Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Geo and Joey Show. Welcome, Joey. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm glad to be here. So, Geo, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about a wonderful article by a scholar a long time ago named J.D. Unwin. And he spoke about what sexuality means to society. And when sexuality changes, what it means to a nation. And we'll explore that. But Joey, I know you have a couple of video clips you want to talk about later. What are those going to be about? Basically, same topic. There's an English writer, Louise Perry. She's actually, I think she still considers herself a feminist, although a kind of unorthodox feminist. And then she's on with Jordan Peterson's daughter, Michaela. And they have a discussion that kind of fits, it fits perfectly with the article and Unwin's ideas. So I thought it would be good to explore that as well. Let me set up the article and why we're talking about it, because obviously in today's society, sexuality is a big issue. We see it all in the news. We see it in debates with schools. And what this article we're going to look at explores this book titled Sex and Culture. We decided to break down the article instead of the book because the book is like 600 pages long, to be honest. And so we want to keep this semi-brief. The article is a great exposition of what the book Sex and Culture is talking about. And so we're going to dive into it and discuss some of the quotes by Kirk Durston, why sexuality, morality may be far more important than you ever thought. And in this day and age, it's a hot topic. Here is the first quote I want to bring up. It says, this is what Unwin discovered. He says, Unwin examines the data from 86 societies and civilizations to see if there's a relationship between sexual freedom and the flourishings of culture. What makes the book especially interesting is that we in the West underwent a sexual revolution in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s and are now in a position to test the conclusions he arrived at more than 40 years ago. And this is why this excites me, because Unwin concluded that when a nation's sexual morality goes downhill, within three generations, which for him is about between 90 and 100 years, you will see the decline of the nation, and it's inevitable. Guess what, folks? We are in the time where we should be seeing the conclusions that Unwin broke down, and sadly, we are starting to see them. The thing that was most interesting to me when we were going over this article was Unwin wrote his book in the 1930s. That's before the sexual revolution. And yet all the things that he lays out and he says, we're seeing it played out that way exactly. So I just think that the kind of prophetic like insight almost that he's had here is what's so remarkable. Yeah, it's amazing you use the word prophetic because even though we're not going to be appealing to scripture here, it almost does have a prophetic insight and it does match with what this podcast is all about. What we are arguing about, the natural law has its consequences. And when we avoid those or when we discard those better yet, and we begin to see the consequences. Let's go back to the next quote. Here are certain conclusions and findings. He says, Increased sexual constraint, either pre or post nuptial, always led to increased flourishing of a culture. But in the green, listen to what he says. Conversely, increased sexual freedom always led to the collapse of a culture three generations later. I think it was in the 70s when like the birth control pill came out. And then obviously 1973, we saw Roe versus Wade made the law of the land. What that did, not perfectly, but what that did was kind of separate, at least in Americans' minds, sex from parenting, sex from responsibility, which ultimately separated it from marriage. Obviously, what we saw coming out of that, right, is because these methods are not foolproof, right, birth control is not foolproof, all these things, we saw an explosion. So even though technically the technology was there, that made it so that you could prevent pregnancy or whatever, we actually saw an explosion of out of wedlock births because these methods aren't perfect, but yet people were still now engaging in this behavior more. One thing that, not in the clips that we're going to show, but one thing that was brought out in the interview that we're going to be talking about later was how out of wedlock birth originally, there used to be a concept called the shotgun wedding, which is 
if people had sex out, outside of marriage, there was a social expectation that then they would get married to raise this kid. But as birth control became more common and as it became, there kind of started to be a social disconnect here between sex and responsibility, blame started getting put on the woman. You must have not been on the pill or whatever. And so it just kind of exacerbated. And so we'd see that like the old way, right, where you put these restraints on, we say, if you do make a mistake or whatever, you know, we're fallen humans, but you got to be responsible for it. And when that was more the case, I think that was better for children. But what we're seeing now is just an explosion of like fatherless homes. And I don't think that leads to a free society ultimately. Yeah. And I remember the quote you're talking about, even though we're not going to share it in this podcast. I remember thinking about that, about the shotgun wedding. And something you alluded to is that when women began to take the pill, it freed them, in quotes, to have more sexual partners. Where at that point, if there was a mistake, the guy was claiming, who's to say it's my child? And at that time, there were no paternity tests like we have today. And so the video goes on to say it allowed for deadbeat dads to get away with it. And it became a hassle. And so it put women more in a bind. As the video says, and we'll get back to the article here, the single mothers are high on the poverty list. Why? Because dads are escaping and shirking a responsibility. So this is not just on the women. It's also on the men who have lost their sense of duty and responsibility. If they father a child to be responsible for the wife, the mother of the child and for the child. Let's look at the second half of this quote. It says the single most influential factor Unwin went on to say, was surprisingly, the data revealed that the single most important correlation with the flourishing of a culture, whether prenuptial chastity was required or not, it had a very significant effect either way. So what does he mean by this? What he means by this is if sex was reserved for marriage, when society had that notion, the society thrived. When sex just became for pleasure and to have it wherever you want, whenever you want, regardless of responsibility, society declined. And we see that right like right now. I think of there was a couple of years ago, I think it was like 2015, 2016, there was a show that used to be on Fox News called Red Eye. And they had this program where they would have people of different views and stuff come on. And I remember there was the comedian, the liberal comedian Amy Schumer who I think is actually like a niece of Chuck Schumer from the Senate and a political commentator from the right, Stephen Crowder was on and they were having a conversation about chastity and he was unmarried at the time. And he was making the point that he was waiting till marriage and everyone, this is Fox News, right? This is supposed to be a right wing. Even the host kind of laughed at it and made a joke. They were making fun of him, but it was like, it was kind of making this weird. But Amy got into this little sparring match with him. It was mostly friendly, but it was like, the sparring match was like, nah, that's just weird, right? So in other words, we're already seeing in our culture where we're far beyond the point where chastity and reserving for marriage has become, has long since been thrown away as the norm. And when you couple waiting till marriage with this next quote, the most powerful combination for the thriving of a nation, Unwin concluded, was prenuptial chastity coupled with absolute monogamy. And what are some of the things we're seeing in today's society? Open marriages, polyamorous marriages. And when you begin to degrade the nuclear family, Unwin concluded in all 86 nations that the decline is inevitable in three generations. I think it's true. It's not going to be a podcast that's partisan. We got to criticize both sides. And we can see this has affected both sides of the hour. Republican conservatives, many of them have kind of the same issues with the sexual revolution that the left has. I forget who was at the Senate, but somebody said it's like something about Republicans are just progressives driving the speed limit, but everybody's pushing us to the left. Even going back to the 90s, it was a big deal for Republicans and conservatives that President Bill Clinton had an affair in the White House. And that was a big deal. That was something they were saying, no, this isn't right. We want moral standards from our leaders. And for whatever reasons, there can be prudential reasons to support somebody in an election. 
but the last Republican president, he was not an oh, exemplar of a sexual purity. It's just kind of interesting how we've gone from the 90s and Clinton to Trump in the, you know, the 2000s. They're very similar men in that way. And no doubt what you were saying, this is not a partisan podcast. It's true when it comes to many on the Republican side, they just hide their deviancy better. And they hide it under a cloud sometimes of conservatism just because they think it'll be popular with their constituents. But sexuality is a problem for both of the left and the right. And without appealing to scripture, we have to see that Unwin's conclusion, by the way, Unwin wasn't a religious person. And his conclusions are backed by facts and data and studying 86 societies. And so when we deviate from the nuclear family, when we begin to destroy the nuclear family, we begin to destroy society and it's almost like a self-inflicting wound. Let's keep going on this article. When strict chastity was no longer the norm, absolute monogamy, deism, and rational thinking also disappeared within three generations. And boy, are we seeing that now where words no longer have the meaning they used to have, where people do not know today what is a... What is a woman? <laughs> Quote Matt <laughs> Walsh. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's incredible. A simple biology is no longer taken for granted. And it's because people have made sexuality the all-encompassing reason for their life. And sexuality is just a part of a normal human being. It shouldn't be the central. And yet we see that in society today. Everywhere in our culture, right? It's kept from the entertainment that we watch. Things that we now would consider PG-13 would have been considered like absolutely lewd and obscene to like our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation. It probably would have been a town uprising. Those standards have eroded and we've seen this all throughout our society. Look at this next almost prophetic quote. It says, if total sexual freedom was embraced by a culture, that culture collapsed within three generations to the lowest state of flourishing. And it's characterized by people who have little interest in much else other than their own wants and needs. That is, to me, describing society today, isn't it? Where everybody is after what's good for me and not for the whole. Absolutely. And I think this kind of goes into a conversation of what is liberty? Both sides of the political aisle, we like talking about freedom and liberty. We have different conceptions of that, but we're always talking about it from the perspective of my rights. And don't get me wrong, I believe in rights. I believe in natural rights. But every right is coupled with a responsibility. I think Michael Knowles kind of laid this out well on The Daily Wire. We said the left has been pushing for ultimate individual rights in regard to sexuality, but the right has been pushing for ultimate individual rights with the economy and stuff. But nobody wants to talk about what do those rights mean we have to do? What is our responsibility here? And I think that's just another example of this playing out in other areas. Another way to say what our responsibilities are, it's what's our duty? Each of us in our individual freedom still has a duty to those around us. And it starts where? As a man, as a father, it starts in my family circle. I have a duty to my wife. I have a duty to my three daughters. And then beyond that, I have a duty to my neighbors to love my neighbor as I would want him to love me. And beyond my neighbors, then I have a duty as a citizen. And encompassing all of that, our duty is to pursue truth. Truth has to win out. Because if you have your own truth and I have my own truth, well, we're starting to see the ramifications of that in society today. I saw a picture of something that is not biologically real. Look at this. What does it say? People have periods. That is incorrect. Women have periods. And no matter what kind of surgery you <laughs> want to have, women have periods. And that's the desire of my wants and needs that supersede reality, and that can't happen. I want to be very clear. I think the people in that photo, I'm not going to say transgender people, right? Because that kind of implies that the thesis is true. 
but people with gender dysphoria, so I like to phrase it. These are people who are hurting, I believe. I'm not laughing at them, but I'm laughing at the culture that takes this seriously because it's not a serious culture. In other words, if we were a serious culture, we'd try to help these people. We try to help them see themselves in relation to reality. I know it's been said before, but it's like if you have an anorexic person, this is a person who believes that they're fat, right? You don't help that person by confirming that they're fat and sending them more into an eating complex. You help them see reality that they're not fat and that they're actually in danger of dying because they're starving themselves or whatever. I view gender dysphoria in much the same way. And for the audience, Joey and I, what is the end game? The end game for anything that is contrary to nature is to love them, to love them enough to tell them the truth, to love them enough that they can find a desire to pursue truth at any cost to themselves. And I had a conversation yesterday with my wife, and I want to share this with you. We heard someone say that when it comes to obesity, they don't have a choice that is genetically wired into their biology. And it's because the propensity to overeat comes natural to them. But that's just it. We as a society have been accustomed to think that choices that are good for us are always easy. And they're not. I am naturally a night owl. I would love to stay up to one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. I could doing work and research, but I make the decision to go to bed early because I know it's best for me, even though it's not my natural propensity. People have this idea that working out doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come naturally to me either. And I work out six days a week. We have to make choices when we know they're for our good, regardless of how we feel about them. Any thoughts on that notion? The choices aren't always easy. I agree with that. And right, the whole conversation has been about like, if you're born with something, if you're born with a propensity to something, that therefore precludes choice. That's just not true. We're all born fallen, right? We're all born sinful. And yet, because, and again, this is, we're not going to get into the biblical side of it, but as Christians, we believe that, you know, we can have a newness of life, right? Obviously, I believe that's in Christ. Mm -hmm. But I, for my atheist brothers and sisters, my Jewish brothers and sisters, they can also strive to live a better life. And I, I see it every day. There's plenty of atheist people who give up drinking or give up smoking, make improvements in their life. You can be born with a propensity for alcohol. But generally speaking, if you become an alcoholic, you engaged in drinking. Then any natural desire that you have towards alcohol, that doesn't excuse you from misusing it and abusing your family. You know what I mean? You still have agency, even if you're born with, and you are born with a propensity to wrong. I know you and myself, we have our propensities, but we have to fight against them because either we have a duty to our family, we have a duty to ourselves, or we have a duty to society. And that's excluding the fact that ultimately you and I have a duty to God. But truth, it's never going to be easy. The pursuit of truth has to be priority number one. I'll stay to the atheist. They pursue truth, and I'm glad for that. Continue, though, to pursue truth, and it will lead you to the truth. And we'll get into that some other day. Now I'm going to share with the audience a quote that really you enjoyed. So go ahead and read it and then tell us why you enjoyed that quote. The history of these societies consists of a series of monotonous repetitions, and it is difficult to decide which aspect of the story is the more significant. The lamentable lack of original thought, which in each case the reformers displayed, or the amazing alacrity with which, after a period of intense compulsory continence, sexual restraint, the human organism seizes the earliest opportunity to satisfy its innate desires in a direct or perverted manner. Sometimes a man has been heard to declare that he wishes to both to enjoy the advantages of high culture and to abolish. Particularly that first line there, right, where it says the history of these societies consists of a series of monotonous repetitions. He was talking specifically there about culture. And I think what I found so interesting about that is when you look at our culture, you look at the movies we produce, the shows we produce, they're all kind of the same, right? There's a lack of creativity. 
in our culture. I know on Netflix, I was just seeing an ad for that 90s show and I watched uh, like an episode or whatever, where it's like, it's a repeat of another show. And we do that all the time. I know uh, Fuller House is a repeat of Full House from the 80s. And we look at all these Disney movies and all the biggest names are like either live remakes or just total remakes of movies from gone past. We see that in a culture. I think it was Andrew Clavin also who said there hasn't been a good movie made in like 30 years or something. <laughs> what we see is that our culture is actually becoming less creative. And I think that goes to this. In other words, the stories we're trying to tell, they have to be the same story. And it has to serve a narrative. I know, and by the way, I support the work that this group does. The Christian movie company, they've got a, anyway, they've got a subscription network. Their name is escaping me. Pure Flex? But, uh, Pure Flex, yes. Yeah. Pure Flex, and I know you know there's like the God Not Dead movies, and I support what they're doing. They're creating family-friendly content and all that. But for years, Christians, that's kind of been what Christian art has been. In other words, rather than talk about truth, rather than tell a true story, the message is central. So in other words, the art is the message. So it's all that rather than just telling a story and that story imbibe truth because it's a true story. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now, the left actually has always been better at storytelling. I'm not going to say always, but in modern society, the left has been better. But now what we're seeing with woke entertainment and stuff is that they're doing the same thing, this falling into the same trap that some Christian entertainment fell in where they're so invested in their priors that that's the story, even if it's not true. I think of one example is female heroes in movies. Female heroes in movies these days, they're not feminine heroes. They're just masculine heroes, but as women. Before it was Sylvester Stallone was the action hero. Now it's Charlize Theron. And it's this feminist narrative that's got to play out. Because the thing with acting, the audience has to suspend belief no matter what, because it's acting. But now <laughs> they're asking us to suspend belief to a level that's just kind of ridiculous. And I think two things. I think that opens up an avenue for Christians and Christian content creators to tell legitimate stories. I think of an example, Mel Gibson has made a couple of movies lately. One of them, a couple of years back, he made... Hacksaw Ridge, where he made a movie yeah. Yeah. about a true story about a, a veteran who from World War II who actually won the Congressional Medal of Honor. But the movie wasn't like preaching Christianity. And yet I thought the movie was uplifting just because of the way the story was told. And so I think if we take a lesson from that and we practice chastity, because that's what Unwin is making the point is, mm -hmm. is that when we don't and we just unrestrain our freedoms, we lose that creativity because ultimately I believe all true creativity comes from a higher source. When we try to be sexually free, we also want the loving and the caring and the love and the sense of companionship and built together that we had when we had a monogamous society, but you can't have both. Sexual revolution is so addicting Society kind of knows is headed down a precipice, yet they can't seem to stop themselves. And you can't have it both ways. And that's where I was talking about earlier that choices aren't always easy. What's good for you and what's good for society, sometimes you have to make hard choices. And society doesn't seem to have the willpower to make those hard choices. And when we cowered to people with fringe ideas that aren't based on reality, we're not doing society, ourselves, or them any good. Agreed. Let's look at this next quote here, where he goes down and begins to make certain assumptions. He goes, as predicted, based on Unwin's conclusions, and now we're at the point in society where we should be seeing these conclusions, considering he wrote about 40 years before the 60s or 30 years. He says, as predicted, absolute monogamy has already been replaced with modified monogamy. And we see that in society today. Polyamorous relationships, swinging clubs, 
people going in and out of marriage like it was candy. We see this being true. Thoughts on that? It's particularly pronounced in that what is common even for children, right? The conversations we're seeing now where we've got TikTok putting out stuff for particularly younger minds, 12, I think, to like 16 is the demographic age on there. And it, there's sexual content on there. It's talking about how I'm in this polyamorous, you know, polycule or whatever. And I've never been happier. I've never been more liberated. But it's easy to pretend like that in a 30 second video. But yet these kids are kind of imbibing that and thinking that's reality. The same thing has happened with Instagram. People see these highly edited photos of these couples that seem to be happy living their promiscuous lifestyle and having fun. But like, that social media masks the pain that, that undergirds. Yeah, in a future episode, we'll talk about specifically that, what's happening to the young adult crowd. And even though they sell a veneer of happiness, the stats and society at large, and when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, you begin to see that it's really not fulfilling. They're being sold a bill of goods with no currency really behind it. Look at this next step that we're seeing in society. When sexual revolution goes rampant, it says not only has belief in God greatly decreased since the 60s, but there has been a trend to remove the concept of God from government, the educational system, and the public forum. How do we, Joey, in this podcast, agree with that, yet balance it without going to the other extreme? Completely agree with that quote. Because ultimately, and it's a conversation, Matt Wolf had an episode, he talked about how there's kind of these two competing narratives on our rights, right? Both, we talk about rights again, but it's like, if you remove God from the equation, well, then where do you get those rights? You get them from government. So in other words, when we remove any mention of God from our society, the basis for our rights and the freedoms that you and I both agree with, like religious freedom and the fact that we believe that there's a separation of power between the church and the state, all of that comes from a creation worldview. The idea that we're created with certain rights, because basically any instantiation of that includes restraints, we wanna push against that, but what we're actually pushing against is the very basis of our rights. But obviously, and as we talked about in a previous episode, that's a balance. And again, Andrew Clavin, I go to him a lot. He's one of my favorite that's thinkers. Okay. He says that the balance that we got to strike here, and I think that's what you're getting at with balance here, is that you need virtue and you need virtuous people in able to have a free society. And yet, if you enforce virtue, it ceases to be virtue. So in other words, you need some mechanism as a society to influence people towards virtue and to inculcate virtue in your populace. But when you tip over that line and you're enforcing it, that defeats the purpose as well, because that's not virtue. You mentioned this to me, and I like how you elaborated on it. And when we were talking in private, how the writers of the Constitution said what about morality and the Constitution? So the second president of the U.S., John Adams, he said that our Constitution was created for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. And when we think about that, Lincoln talked about that as well when he was expanding this to include the recently enslaved. We're a self-governing republic. I believe in a total separation of power between the church and the state. I agree. But ultimately, though, what is the state in the United States? What is the government? Well, it's the people. When the people in their private lives have that private religion, have those standards, there isn't even a need to enforce religious edicts because at least a critical, and it's never been everyone, but at least a critical mass of people in your society are self-regulating. And again, I don't think you have to be a Christian to be self-regulating. I think there are plenty of good atheists and agnostics who self-regulate themselves, but there has to be some standard. That's where we get to that balancing line of Again, we talked about before the, the last six commandments, which we can enforce in certain ways, and the first four commandments, which we can't. I definitely think, and what the, this article has been getting at, is what we're seeing is a total degradation of, and elimination of, and resistance to, 
any restraints as seen in the last six commandments, particularly on adultery and whatnot. And that leads us to this next quote. Listen to this. It says, in direct contrast to rational thinking, the pursuit of truth, a post-truth culture abandons shared objective standards for truth and instead stands on appeals to feeling and emotions and what one wants to believe. And boy, is that describing society. How I feel, what is good for me to only think about me is become the norm. Well, if everybody in the planet is only thinking about me, then it's going to naturally lead to disagreement, to war, culture wars, to a society that isn't cohesive. Absolutely. Look at the second half of that quote. It says, people can now identify themselves as something which flat out contradicts science and rational thinking, and in many cases receive the full support and backing of governments and educational system. In Matt Walsh's video, What is a Woman? We saw this play out. And it's sad because truth is no longer something to be sought after by everyone. Truth becomes just a personal bubble of what truth is to me. And that is not healthy for society. This article mentions that and Unwin concluded that once we start going down that line, it becomes inevitably a doom for society. When it comes to people identifying as things that they're not, this is another area. And again, we like tying in on this podcast how rational people, we don't have to appeal to scripture. And so this issue has been one, where we've actually seen some of that common ground. There's a group, I believe they're called negatively by their opponents, TERFs or trans exclusionary <laughs> radical feminists, who are actually kind of starting to agree with conservatives on certain things that we have to have an objective definition of biological reality. She's been a lifelong leftist, still is. JK Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter franchise, who now she's hated by people who 10 years ago would have lifted her up as like a feminist icon, but all because she insists that women exist and they should be protected. I just think that's an element of where the natural law can unite us around certain things. And even if you believe in evolution, for evolution to take place, for evolution to succeed, for the human race to succeed, you need a man and a woman. Listen to this conclusion by Unwin here. He says, Unwin's three main predictions, the abandonment of rationalism, deism, and absolute monogamy are all well underway, which makes the ultimate prediction appear to be credible. The collapse of Western civilization in the third generation. And according to Unwin's conclusions or timeline, that number will be reached somewhere between now and 2050. That's amazing because many of his predictions are already coming true. As the sexual norms become more open, they start minimizing the traditional marriage, start minimizing the nuclear family. We see more awkward things, more irrational things take place in society. And eventually he says, and I don't think this article mentions it, but I've read the 600 page Unwin book, Sex and Culture. We'll put a link to it if you want it yourself in the show notes, is that once a nation goes down this path, its destruction is inevitable. And sadly, if the 200 plus year Roman Empire can go down, America is not immune. We can't control what society does, yeah. but what we can control is what we do. And so while it's true, trends are what they are. The thing I would say is to any individual watching is you can still make good decisions in your own life. The empire can fall and yet there were still Christians in the empire as it fell. There were still people who had families. I think there is a movement and this isn't us, but there's a movement online of people who they see the problems and so they tune out. I think of the men's right community. There's a group called MGTOW, men going their own way. They look at the sexual revolution, they look how court systems disadvantage men, and they say, you know what, we're just going to swear off women and relationships entirely. If we are going to have relationships, we're just going to do our own thing, do what's best for us. I don't think we need to be blackpilled. There's still a good life to be had, even if society continues going off the cliff. Personal decisions can still provide a better life. That's the one 
kind of more red pilling or no, I think white pilling. I got to get that lingo right. The yeah, white pilling I, I, aspect. I'm not advocating that we abandon ship. I'm advocating the opposite. Let those of us who want to pursue truth in whatever avenue, whether it's biology or whether it's religion or whether it's politics, pursue truth for the truth's sake, not for an agenda. And I think it can help with society. Listen to this, which the article says, it says correlation does not entail causation. Unwin makes it clear that he does not know why sexual freedom directly leads to the decline and collapse of cultures. Although he suggests that when sexual energy is restrained through celibacy or monogamy, it is diverted into more productive social energy. And so the reason I bring this up is because Unwin was balanced. He understood that you can't really tie a direct correlation, but we can. If we wanted to bring scripture in, we could. But let's leave it at that. But even from a natural perspective, when you are spending all of your energy in the pursuit of sexual freedom, it doesn't leave you creativity to pursue anything else. And sex in the confines of marriage, it is pleasurable. It is to be sought after. But when it's done outside of the confines of marriage, it becomes addiction, which why we see so much harm in the pornography industry, where we see so much, when you look at surveys, the more sexual promiscuous you are, the less happy you are. Yet society, there was that lady show years ago where these women were always promiscuous, sex in the city, that kind of behavior. When I speak to women, when I encounter women who have come out of that, they were never happy, including men, by the way, I've spoken to men who were quote unquote players who were ladies, men, they weren't happy. In fact, there's a video going around of Mike Tyson, who said with all his riches and all his money, he had as many women as he wanted. And he said, and I wish I had it. He said with every sexual encounter, he felt that a piece of him was being stolen. And so we see that the pleasure it's supposed to bring, it's only for a season. For those of you who know the scripture, you know that phrase. There's pleasure in sin, but for a season. And we need to get back to traditional marriage. We need to get back to monogamy. I like that you brought out that sex itself is not a bad thing. Because <laughs> there's certain religious sex and certain religious people who can make it seem that way. All right? Or they make it so taboo that they never talk about it. And they think if we never talk about it in our churches, that's how we protect this thing. Except that. The left and culture are happy to talk about it from their perspective. One side's making it a taboo and making it seem like, oh, it's shame attached to it. And the other side is saying, come over here, there's no shame. Well, first of all, it's not true over here, mm -hmm. but over here, it actually would be true if you talk about it from not a Christian, but you just talk about it from monogamy and the benefits to marriage and all that. It's a positive thing and it doesn't have to be a taboo. It's a good thing in its proper role all good things can be abused. I remember years ago, it was the saddest case. A woman wanted to win. I don't know if it was Sony PlayStation and the goal was who could drink the most water in five minutes. Now water is the best drink for you. However, she drank so much. She unbalanced her electrolytes and ended up dying, overdosing on water where anything that is good taken to an extreme sex outside of the confines of marriage becomes the extreme sex trafficking and pornography can destroy that which in itself is good. Joey, we got to wrap this up, but I didn't want to leave without addressing these two clips. Let's show the first clip for the audience and then take us through them. So initially the pill was made available to married women only, and then it was made available to unmarried women as well. Ah. And then not long afterwards, you have, I mean, the, the, the timeline in Britain and America and other um, Western nations is all about the same. Not long afterwards, you then get the decriminalization of abortion. And then not long afterwards, you see the, the shotgun marriage ends as, a, as an institution. Like you, see, you see marriage rates of all kind falling off a cliff, but you also see the shotgun marriage, which had existed to deal with unwanted childbearing, disappears as a social tool. And the, the, the really perverse outcome 
of the pill, which is a beautiful example of the fact that human beings are very, very complicated and our society is very complicated. You, you can't predict how technology shocks are going to affect them. You see um, rates of single motherhood rise. Who would have thought that would happen, right? You, you introduce a technology which allows women to regulate their fertility and it leads to a rise in single motherhood. But I think the reason for that is because the pill isn't 100% effective. No form of contraception is. And actually the early pill in particular, you've got quite a high rate of uh, quite a high failure rate but you end up with the absolute amount of premarital sex goes up and therefore some portion of that is going to result in an unwanted pregnancy and 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 some women for whatever reason don't want to have an abortion and so you'll end up with unexpected babies and when the social institutions that used to exist to regulate fertility like marriage have all fallen away as a result of the pill's introduction what we see in that clip that I think is so important. And I certainly recommend anyone listening, as soon as you're done with this, like and share, but then go over to Michaela Peterson's podcast and listen to this episode in full. It was really, really good and illuminating. And I think it just flows nicely into what we were talking about with the paper that we read. But one thing that I noticed there, I think we can be hard on culture. We can be hard on, when we're talking about these issues, we can be very, these are bad people doing these things. But like these things are the pill. I think abortion is an evil, but these movements, they were for, in other words, there were injustices in our society in certain ways in the way women were treated, especially at coming out of the industrial revolution where women's role in the house that had been so central was kind of pushed to the side. So these things, people, they fought for these things for a reason. And yet, it's the law of unintended consequences. What we've seen, and I think Unwitch did a really good job of illuminating this early on, but a lot of people didn't get it. But it's just when we introduce some new thing that we think is going to give us more freedom, ultimately, if it's not in line with natural law, it's going to make us less free. And I feel for like single mothers, and I think as Christians, as decent people, we should care for them and we should love them because ultimately they do have children and the other thing is they made a good choice after their bad choice. I don't think we should hate on anyone, but I just think as we've let these guardrails slip away, and I like how Luis Perry says it, these social institutions that were supposed to inculcate this virtue as that's gone away, it's left a lot of suffering in its rake. That's the problem. We think we are enlightening ourselves. We think we're getting better, but as we tear down traditional values, society becomes and more anarchy. Joey, uh, there's one more clip you wanted to share. And so let's look at that here before we sign off. It became a biological choice for women. Fatherhood became a social choice for men. And it became socially it became socially acceptable for men to walk away from children um, in a way that it hadn't been before. Not to say that there hadn't always been cases of scoundrels, you know, impregnating women and then and then leaving. But it is now the deadbeat dad is now completely socially acceptable in a way that he wasn't before, and is really in a way that one of the one of the winners of the sexual revolution because there's now no there's now no I mean the the, the rates of non-payment of child support are astonishingly high. And it shouldn't surprise us that single mothers are some of the, um, is the group that the group of people most likely to be in poverty, while married mothers are least likely to be, which is why I have a chapter at the end of my book where I make a feminist case for marriage and say that actually marriage is completely in the interests of, of, of mothers and, and of children. This is what I think is so important, right? Because what we're talking about is as Protestants, we want to be able in this podcast to explain rational reasons, philosophical and otherwise, for the things that we believe and the things that we believe society should do without appealing directly to scripture. And I don't think there could be a better case here than what she's laying out about marriage, in that marriage puts the implication that there's going to be this couple that's going to come together, the man is going to do his part, the woman's going to do her part, and they're going to raise a family. What she's laying out there, right, about deadbeat dads kind of being socially acceptable, there was a time when that wasn't the case, if you were a guy and you were not taking care of your kids, 
that would have been socially frowned upon. But now it's so ubiquitous that it's just like, what ifs? And again, this is one of those things where we can look at that in terms of just looking at the situation and saying, something's not right here. This isn't good for children. I don't need to go to scripture. I just look at it and be like, there's a system here that's set up. And as we've moved away from it, it's created chaos. And the stats bear this out, right? When it comes to fatherless homes and it comes to children from homes where fathers aren't there, higher crime rate among the boys, higher rates of them end up becoming deadbeat dads, higher suicide rates among girls, higher depression rates among girls, are more likely that the girls will wind up in an abusive relationship if they didn't have a father in the home. There's so many things just from the natural law that we can look and we can see this situation isn't good. And there's a word which in our modern society gets a bad rap, and that's patriarchy. And I think it gets a bad rap. Jordan Peterson does a good job of laying this out, is that it gets a bad rap and this kind of hierarchy because when it's corrupted, when the guy isn't doing what he should, it can be oppressive. Yes. But when it's ordered towards service and servant leadership, it actually is a good thing when men lead their families well, when men protect their families, when they sacrifice for their families, that actually is a good thing. But toxic masculinity, and obviously that gets called, any masculinity gets called toxic <laughs> yeah, masculinity. Yeah. But actual toxic masculinity is the deadbeat dad culture. One example I like to use, all things being equal, unless your wife is a SWAT team member or a Navy SEAL or a police officer, just nature teaches us, I have a one-year-old in the home. If somebody's breaking in, I'm not going to tell my wife, let me have the three girls and the baby. I'll cower in this room in the back corner and you go find out what's happening. That's just not society. And when we destroy those gender roles, because we are two separate genders, we're male and female, we're both equal, yet we have our own sphere of influence. There are biological differences. And when they are in harmony, working together, a married couple is unstoppable. They can achieve anything. They can change their family tree and generations, and they can be a blessing to society. When that is attacked upon, it is detrimental to society. And even though single mothers are loved and they're blessed, they have a harder road to climb when they have to do it by themselves because some deadbeat father is no longer in the picture. And yet society seems to encourage that in this new wave feminism. And I do like the video because, and I do recommend you watch it because there is two women instead of us two men talking about similar things that we talked about. Joey, as we sign off here, it's a long video, uh, but we just had a great conversation. What are your final thoughts before we sign off? In the words of the great bioethicist Leon Cass, there's a certain wisdom in our repugnance. Because we're sinful, we can have bad prejudices. We can have prejudices based on racial discrimination and stuff, which I think is sinful and wrong. Within our human reason, what we see is that there are certain things that naturally we see are right, but we want to silence them because whatever. And I think there's a wisdom in not silencing that repugnance. The idea that I think it's kind of natural to not have as much respect for a guy who's shirking at his kids. And I don't think we have to get rid of that. Or there's kind of a natural wisdom in the fact that we know that relationships are better Right when you don't cheat on your, the other person, keep mm -hmm. monogamous. I think we kind of know that, but we, we want to be tolerant, so we got to get rid of that repugnance. But I think there's some wisdom in that, that it's kind of, no matter how far we've gotten in our consciences, there's that little voice telling us, eh, that ain't right. There's a story that there was a thief stealing TVs and radio players from people's houses, and one day he gets home with a bag of goods, and he comes into his home and realizes that somebody broke into his house and stole his things. Well, he ends up going off on a tizzy, calls the police, only for the police to find in the backseat of his car things that he had stolen. And today, too many people want to live with, it's good for you, but not for me. We have to uh, be right to our families, to ourselves, and to society. And only when we have those things in balance can we live in harmony. And those of us who are being cowered by society, 
We need to be able to stand up and articulate without appealing to scripture what is right and wrong. And I think that's what Joey and myself are trying to do. Until next time, stay tuned and thank you for supporting. Subscribe wherever possible. Follow Gio and Joey on Twitter and we'll put our handles in the show notes. Until next time, God bless, take care and continue to fight the good fight. <music>